Martin Eddie Nonprofit Radio coverage of 18NTC from New Orleans, Louisiana at the Convention Center. This interview is sponsored by Network for Good, easy to use donor management and fundraising software for nonprofits. My guest is Emily Patterson. She's founder of B Measure. Welcome, Emily. Hello, thanks for having me. Welcome back, because I talked to you yesterday <laughs> too as part of a panel. Now you're solo. It's good yep. to have you. Yes, my pleasure. And uh, your topic this time for today is track your nonprofit's IRL work digitally. You love digital, you love data, right? You're in, you're in data deep. Yep, I am a data fiend. <laughs> okay, um, I think your session description may have said data, data geek or data nerd. You're not so many words. Proud yeah. of those. Uh, it's proud. You're <laughs> uh, without, yeah, it's it's cool problem. to be a nerd now. It, I definitely, it, it, yes. It absolutely is. 10 years ago, even five years ago, it was not so cool. Yeah, it absolutely I, is. L read the Twitter profiles. They, so many of them say geek, nerd. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I All always right, tell so. people I do the uh, nerdy side of marketing. So Embrace it. Embrace it's often it. the yes. stuff that other people, you know, don't want to do because it's not creative. It involves lots of Excel. Okay, you're, but you're in it and you love it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, all right. So, what? What's? Why do we need this session? Let's just break it down. What? What's? So, what's so important here that's not getting done quite right? You feel? So I mean the. Uh, she's rolling up her sleeves. If you don't watch in the video, she's rolling up her sleeves. <laughs> Okay, we're getting into it. No, excellent. Uh, yeah. My inspiration was that there's so many tools to track online what you're doing. Um, you know, if you're putting out stuff on social media or your website or email or basically anything that's on the internet or digital di digitalized. Uh, digitized. We just want digi digitized, right? Digitized. Digitized. Yeah, <laughs> I think. Okay. Uh, anything that's online, it's totally easy to track. You know, it's probably harder to figure out what data to be looking at or to pick a, a vendor to track it than it is to actually get the data. That's the easy part. Um, but a lot of nonprofits, I would say almost all of them, I mean, they're not just based online. They have a lot going on on the ground too. You know, the, the people that they're trying to serve, they live real lives. Uh, they're sometimes interacting with computers or their cell phones, but they're doing a lot in their regular life too that you want to know about. So this was uh, to look at a couple of different case studies for how nonprofits in two totally different fields, uh, so we had conservation and then consumer protection, uh -huh. about how they built these digital platforms and then got people to report on what they were doing in their real lives um, into them and then so that they could get the data to create uh, more educational content or do press outreach or um, you know, tweak their programs so that they were more effective. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Okay, so what, what's the best way to go into this? Should we just should we go right into the, the case studies that you have? Sure, or happy want, to talk we, about or them. Or we, should we lay some groundwork even more first? What, what do you feel? You think we're ready for the case studies? I mean, there was a couple, I could talk a little bit about similarities uh, between the problems that they faced, or maybe I should explain the case studies first. Okay, let's do the case studies. All right, so uh, now I saw three in your description. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it just two? Or well, the, the two, two of them. I have America Forest, New Dream, and the Better Business Bureau. Um, Are we focusing on two out of the three? Yeah, so I had Better Business Bureau and American Forest Foundation, and there was two projects from American Forest Foundation that were, you know, kind of complementary. Okay, okay. The New Dream is out. Yeah, New Dream, New they Dream, were unable New to attend the conference, right, New Dream <laughs> unfortunately. Was a, New Dream turned into a nightmare, so <laughs> let's deal with what we no, have. they're not okay. a nightmare at all. Okay. They're, they're okay. very nice. Well, they, they're, they're, they're still <laughs> sleeping. New Dream is still sleeping. Okay, uh, let's do America first. So, uh, America, I'm sorry, America Forest. What can, we, uh, what can we learn from that? What, what, what was the story there? So American Forest Foundation, they're a nonprofit that serves uh, people who own forested land of 10 acres or more. Yes. So it's a very specific audience. Uh, unfortunately, it's also a very hard to reach audience because it's not like you can just buy an email list or it's go on find. Facebook yeah, and yeah. you know just target this demographic right. because, I mean, what do they who have in common? Do, how do we know who owns forest? Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. So if they're, if they're not publicly owned. Okay. <laughs> so American Forest Foundation, they're always trying to get data from these people about, you know, you know, what do they care about? What are they doing on their land? Because ultimately they want to get them more involved in conservation activities, um, mm -hmm. especially in the, on the east coast of the U.S. Uh, we think about forest land, forest land as, you know, being part of a national park or a state park, but actually a lot of it is owned by these private Landowners, so it might be people who inherited it from their their families, or it's a vacation property. So it's uh, lots of small parcels, and you know it's important yeah, for them ten acres, to ten acres. It could be minimum, right? Minimum ten acres. There are small. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So it's important for them to, you know, and help. It's all, and they're geographically dispersed, right, all over the country, or is this international organization? Or this is the U.S. U.S. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they're all over the country, obviously. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. They're all over the country, but it's a lot of people, especially on the East yeah. Coast. Yeah. Okay. Oh, really? A lot, mostly in the East. Interesting. I would have thought mostly West and, or at least Midwest. No. Uh, well, there's not that many forests. Forests. Forest. <laughs> That's right. We're talking about forest land, not just private <laughs> private ownership. Okay. Forest land, yes. Okay. There's a lot more for, nationally owned land out west. Thank you for west. being thoughtful in, uh, in uh, <laughs> setting me straight. Okay. Yes, there is a lot more forest land. Prairies are important, too, I'm sure. All right, but we're not dealing with America Prairie. Okay. <laughs> that might be a different nonprofit. Go ahead, please. Anyway, so a lot of people, you know, own the land, and they just kind of sit on it. Where There, there are things that they need to be doing to take good care of it. Unfortunately, I'm not a forester, so I, I can't go All into right. great detail, but, right. you know, to improve water quality and animal habitat and um, protect against forest fires, uh, lots of different things. Okay. So American Forest Foundation is always trying to reach these people and, you know, get data from them about, you know, what they're doing on their land and how best to get them to take these actions. So they have a couple of products, um, the website I was talking about was My Land Plan, and it's kind of part, it sprung out of a survey that the um, um, National Forest Service did okay. um, back in like 2011 or so that talked to these small landowners, and they found that, you know, they they didn't really have a lot of good information about forestry that was catering to them. It was very... Uh, written for a very professional level audience. Mm -hmm. They didn't have a lot of good tools to understand what they needed to do. So they built this website um, for this audience, um, you know, to be a tool for them. Right. My land plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So H how did they, how did they draw people to this site? The, 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 the constituency being so difficult to identify, how'd they, how'd they get people to my land plan. Yeah, that was definitely the challenge. Okay, so, how did they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Through a, a lot of testing and a lot of Facebook ads, honestly, ended up being one of the best uh, ways okay. to market to them. Okay. So I know there's a lot of kind of Facebook ads. There's a lot of bread press going on with them right now, of course, unfortunately. Yeah, we're, we're, for, we're, I'm not sure when this is going to air, but we're in the, we're in the week when uh, Mark Zuckerberg is testifying uh, uh, two days before different... Um, congressional committees about uh, Facebook's uh, collaboration or whatever, the work with uh, Cambridge Analytica and also the, uh, the, the Russian hacking. So uh, just to fill listeners in, I don't know when we're going to be airing this, mm -hmm. but it, it may be a couple months from now, but just to hearken back to, that's what Emily's referring to. This is Mark Zuckerberg week uh, uh, in Washington, D.C. Okay, <laughs> yes, go, so go ahead, please. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, so, right, so on, the, yeah, on one hand, I so understand where ads. that's yeah, yeah where yeah. that's coming from. However, at least from having worked with AFF, actually at this point, I I used to work for AFF. Okay. And then um, anyway, this was a couple of years ago. So we tried all sorts of different ways of marketing this site, buying advertising in local newspapers in certain areas where we wanted to reach those landowners, um, buying email lists, and Facebook ads were by far and away the most effective way to reach people. Okay. And we tested a lot of different messages, and it's kind of ironic, um, but the uh, hunting message, uh, targeting people who are interested in hunting, who were interested in improving their land because they wanted to attract more turkeys or deer or elk to it, oh, ended up right. being the most effective way we were able to get new signups for the site. But the okay. person who is yeah. in charge of this program is a vegetarian, so it, was, <laughs> it always pained All her right. to be writing these, uh, <laughs> these hunting ads. Yes, yes. All right. So, uh, so they, that's how they got the people to the site. And then what's the, what's the lesson we can learn from, from AFF, this, this, uh, this survey site? So it didn't really start off as a way to collect data about landowners, but we quickly realized like what a great treasure trove it was. Um, we have set up a lot of tracking using both uh, Google Analytics and then also, mm -hmm. you know, because it's a platform where people can come in and they can identify, you know, what goals they have for their land. They can map their land. They can um, select like almost like a project management type tool mm -hmm. that they want to you know, th do this or that in their future, um, select future projects. So we have all of this information and we know where in the country these people are and we know, um, you know, what, what sorts of things they have on their land, um, how many acres 
you know, have these certain activities identified. Yeah. So we have a lot of information for them. Okay. So kind of in the meantime, American Forest Foundation has transitioned to focus more on, less on finding every single landowner in the U.S. and communicating with all of them, to focusing on landowners in certain areas that have kind of priority projects. Like there's, you know, certain parts of the country where there's, you know, a type of tree that really needs to be rehabilitated um, yeah. because it's a yeah. home for a certain type of wildlife. I want you to I want you to explain this to me like you're talking to your friends, okay? Okay. Keep it, um, uh, yeah, just you know, like let let's drill down to what what if you if if I was asking you what you know what are the what are the lessons I can learn from this case, um, what 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 can we learn? Just help me get to the bottom. I'm trying to get to the bottom line of uh, what's the value for listeners in studying this this AFF case. What can we learn about the their use of data? Um, okay. <laughs> let me let me think about it. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, so so um, you know, in terms of um, what what was the what I guess what was the value to the organization for for collecting all this different type of data about size and what's on it now and what their future plans might be. I mean, how did they how did how did AFF then use the data? That's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, so right now they're, you know, kind of, like I said, focusing on certain areas of the country. Right. So it's pretty cool because you can, they're very interested in measuring whether something was effective or not. Um, so with forestry, it's hard to tell if, you know, like ultimately their end goal here is to, you know, grow, regrow a, a type of forest. But that's a goal that's, you know, 100 years out. Yeah. Um, so uh, my land plan's been a great way of seeing, like, are people taking kind of intermediate level actions to kind of get them to this bigger end game? So, you know, we don't, you, previously, you know, you might be sending people surveys in the mail to ask them, you know, have you done X, Y, Z? Um, or they would, you know, schedule a visit with like a, with a forester. That was another big thing. You know, those are all very time consuming to measure. Yeah. Um, you know, anything that involves the mail or in-person visits are super expensive and, you know, just yeah, very, very time consuming. Scale. Yeah, of course. So this was kind of a way for, you know, people to proactively go online and do some self-reporting on those actions. Okay. And so okay. then they're and, able... And so enormously scalable, mm -hmm. targetable. You can drive people from certain regions to there. Yeah. Okay, okay. So now you have all these people in this platform and we know, oh, we, they live in this certain area. Mm -hmm. So you can see if they get these emails, um, messages from their local forestry department saying like, hey, you need to do this stuff on your land. Go to the platform, you know, read about it, then schedule this thing. You know, now we have the ability to track that whole process and be able to see, okay, 5% of the people who got this email did X, Y, Z. You know, previously they had no idea. You know, people might get a... E a postcard in the email, uh, a postcard in the mail saying they need to do something or a visit from a forestry professional, and you know who knows what happened with that. Okay, okay, okay. Um, so the uh, so the the value of uh, I mean, you you built this site for people to go to. Uh, it's it's really sort of a survey, but it's not a Mailchimp survey. You know, I mean it's. It's a lot friendlier and more interactive, so it's not your it's, it's not what most people think of as a survey. No, it's a little bit. I think it's interesting because it's a little bit of a it's a little bit for the audience, and then it's also a little bit for the organization. Yeah, like, yeah for sure. It's a tool that's useful for them. There's a lot of information on there, um, but then it also you know gives data to AFF that they wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, so you, I think, you know, that's definitely one of the lessons is you can't create a platform that's just, hey, give us a bunch of data about yourself because most likely people aren't going to really want to yeah. participate in that. Right. So there has to be an incentive for value, them. Mm -hmm. Value for them. Okay. Okay, very good. Um, I think one of the things that AFF did do with the data that was interesting that um, people, the uh, users always really liked is they would do kind of a report at the end of the year putting together, hey, this is what was most popular on my land plan, and send it out to the users. So it's kind of like, even though you're giving us your data and we, you know we're doing stuff with it, like, you get to see it too. Yeah. And they like, you know, people are always kind of nosy about what everyone yeah. else is doing. <laughs> so shared results. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Any more? Anything else we should uh, flesh out about that one before we go to Better Business Bureau? Mm -hmm. I think 
that's you everything. You covered it? Okay, okay. How about the Better Business Bureau story? All right, so <laughs> this, one is, this one is totally different. Okay, um, good. This is about scams. Okay, <laughs> what, what kinds of scams? So, and honestly, this one is a, a kind of an interesting mirror image to the, to the other story. So, right. Better Business Bureau, they, you know, they of course report on businesses, but they also get a lot of people interested in reporting scams to them. And um, it was kind of always something that people would think of when they thought of the Better Business Bureau. And but for a long time, they didn't. Ha then they didn't have anything to do. They didn't have any way for people to to report um, if they had been contacted by a scammer or had fallen for a scam. They only did legitimate businesses and complaints against real businesses okay. that existed. So we're talking about mail scams, email scams, mm -hmm. phone scams. Pretty much any type of scam. All this. Okay, not just business scams. Yeah, or not just a fraudulent business. Okay. So okay. it would be something like, you know, somebody might contact you pretending to be a real business. Like yeah. you get an email from someone saying, oh, you know, this is Capital One. You need to update your password. Please click on this link yeah. oh and then enter your social security <laughs> number <laughs> and your right. mother's maiden right. name. Right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> Why stop there? Birth, date of birth would be nice, too. We'd, we need to have that also. Um, okay. So they didn't have a capacity for um, collecting all this. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, they want to turn around and help consumers. All right. So, so what did they do? Yeah. So they do, you know, do a lot of consumer education. So, yeah. so they build an, a platform, um, you know, just like American Forest Foundation. But this time, instead of people reporting on their land, it's people reporting on... Um, their scams. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's called uh, BBB Scam Tracker, and you, if you, you know, see a Facebook scam, just to bring up Facebook again, <laughs> or you, you get called by someone on the phone, you go there and you fill out this form. It has information about, you know, what was the business that contacted you, what was the method. Um, they have classifications of different scams. So it's basically um, some information about your your age and location, whether you're a member of the military. Uh, a lot of different fields that they use for reporting. Um, you fill that all out, you fill out the scam details, and then it goes into a database. And uh, unfortunately, BBB is not a, um, a uh, you know, police. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they unfortunately can't investigate and arrest anybody, but they've been using this for, you know, consumer education, we create a lot of uh, contents with it. Um, you know, uh, the, uh, it's all open to the press, you know, not your personal details, but reporters will go in there to find victims so that they can do stories oh, to okay. help alert people about, you know, these scams. Because honestly, I think like awareness, just knowing like this is out there, don't click on this yeah. is the most important thing. What, what kind of content have they been creating from it? Uh, you know, news articles, um, you know, it's regularly pretty in, uh, I was just working the other day because I got uh, they're one of my clients too, you know, helping a reporter from CBS, um, you know, find victims uh, okay. for yep. for yep. a story about um, you know a new scam. Okay. So that happens all the time. Do they do alerts or anything uh, as they see trends? Do they say you know we're seeing this special kind of phishing scam or this particular kind of phishing scam? Do they do, they do consumer alerts also or no? Yes, they uh, do. Breaking I... news in in, <laughs> in fraud. I know I'm the data person, but uh, I actually write the alerts about scams. Okay, so talk about it. I have a special it. Well, right, passion so for scams. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, when I'll, I will go in there um, or I will get an email from uh, one of the local BBBs saying, you know, hey, we're seeing a lot of phone calls from this or I'll see a lot of reports on this certain thing and I'll write a weekly alert about it. So um, this week, if you are interested, I can tell you about, about what I wrote. <laughs> What's happening this week? Go ahead. So honestly, the, it is, I have been doing this for maybe eight years now, and it never stops. Like there's always some sort of new scam out there. Uh, and so this week it was, um, scammers are, if you leave a bunch of tabs open on your browser, which yes. I do all the time, okay. scammers can... If you have a like a login page, um, they can hack into your computer and um, upload, you know, reload the website with a fake login page. So if you have like the login to your bank up there, the yeah. reload instead of it being you know wellsfargo.com, it's now scam scam scam.com. But you, you don't look at the URL, so you can put in your login information, and then now they have it. They capture it. All right. So don't keep. So don't keep a form. Form pages open. I mean, is it only for logins, or could be any? Could it be any form. I suppose page? it could be any. Yeah. 
Okay. I suppose well, it could be any page, but they want it to be a login because that's where you're going to be entering okay. well, the information that well, they want to capture. Well, I was thinking it was a credit card purchase page, and then you went off oh. to do some, <laughs> you went off to do research, uh, a comparative price somewhere else, um, and in the meantime, okay. But keep your keep your keep your form tabs closed. Don't keep don't keep form tabs open. Yeah, you know All we right. just don't pay that much attention to what's going no. on. I am All guilty right. of this too. Yeah, so always double check the URLs before you enter in okay. personal okay. information. Okay. But BBB does a lot of research too with the information that they collect. So they publish, um, you know, a, a yearly survey about uh, a yearly report on called the BBB annual scam report or something, and it's all about people who, you know, what data they've seen, what different demographics are affected by scams, you know, what what types of scams are trending, right. all sorts of, they have a research department who handles this, so. Okay. Okay. Uh, you want to give us uh, closing thoughts, and then we're going to wrap up. Uh, closing thoughts about, you know, just about the topic generally, how, why, why it's important to track what's going on in real life using uh, digital data. Yeah, so I think having the data in a in a digital form, like data of course has always existed through surveys or you know, on, on people on recording things on paper. To have it in a digital way is it makes just just so much more useful, like so much more accessible. So you can have, you know, not, neither of these organizations, BV is national, but you know, they only have a few people in their in their national office working on this sort of thing. So mm. you can with a smaller staff uh, be able to produce, you know, some really interesting project products with your with your data that you're collecting if you have it in a central location, and if you're able to get your people who are spread out all over the place to, you know, report what's going on in their lives. You know, I'm just a contractor for BBB. I spend only a couple hours a week writing these scam alerts, but it's because I have all that information in one place. I don't have to like call up people from all over the country to right. uh, to get this. And because of that, you know, we've able to get you know, lots of press pickup and outreach and just do a lot more education. So even though it seems like a big expense to build these platforms, um, you know, I definitely think it's worth it. If, it, if it's a part of your mission. Yeah, yeah if you have yeah. a lot of, especially a lot of educational, um, if you have a big educational mission where you're trying to reach a lot of people, data is now really important. You know, I think. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Okay. Data, data is important. important. We opened with we opened with the data <laughs> the data nerd, and now we're going to close with the importance of data. She's Emily Patterson, founder of B Measure. That's B E E Measure, and this is Tony Martinetti nonprofit radio coverage of 18 NTC, the nonprofit technology conference. All our interviews here are sponsored by Network for Good, easy to use donor management and fundraising software for nonprofits. Thank you very much, Emily. Thanks. Thanks My for pleasure. Me. You're welcome. Thank you for being with us.